Hello my fellow gnomes and welcome back to our doors game and today we're just going to be finishing a few things up. So at the moment if we're playing with two players you can see I've turned the highlights on so I can see all the kitchen items and I grab some items off the shelf so player two has got the jam and the chili and if this player is to die or they just leave the game right if they leave then oh no the player that's left he can't get his jam and his chili anymore and he's not going to be able to complete the recipe and he's not going to be able to escape out of the kitchen. So we need to do something about that. So if I go into my item script here, um, you can see I've got that highlight turned on so I can see what I'm doing. But uh, inside of our interaction function, we may remember that we have this prompt that we disabled and then we completely destroyed our template item. Well, how about instead of destroying the template, um, we could set its parent to nil. And then just as a demo, let's wait, say, three seconds and add it back onto the shelf. Um, so we, we are going to need a reference to the previous parent. So let's say local original parent and we'll just save a little reference to that. So then we can reset these back after three seconds. We'll turn the prompt back on and we'll set the parent to the original parent. So now if I join the game and let's say I find this item, here's a bag of onions or potatoes or something, there we go. And if we wait a few seconds, it'll, there we go, we've got another one on the shelf and we could just keep picking up loads of these, loads and loads of bags of potatoes. There we go, we've got three of them. Obviously we don't want to do that, but now we have a way to turn something on and off. We just need to react to when that player dies or they leave the game. So let's cover the dying scenario. Uh, let's find the player's humanoid. So the humanoid will be equal to player.character and we'll do a wait for child for the humanoid and we can connect humanoid.died, connect that in to a function and then we also want to check for if the player leaves the game as well. Now there isn't a player dot player left event. So instead we're going to have to connect to all of the players and the, the player service has a player removing event. And we're going to have to connect that into a function and check if the, let's call this leaving player, if the leaving player giving to us by the player removing event if their user ID is the same as uh, the player who's interacted with this item then we know we want to check otherwise we will just ignore it right it's just somebody else that's left the game it's not related to this item in question now if it is the user ID that we're interested in then we should probably uh, disconnect this event rather than keeping it running the whole time so let's just create a little removing connection variable set this equal to this event and then we can disconnect it. Now, since we've got these two kind of events, we want to um, both do the same thing for. We don't want to copy and paste all the code. Uh, now, normally I do functions right up on the global level. So I'll have like local function and what would be check item on remove, something like that. Uh, and I put it up here. But since I've got a bunch of um, all these different parameters and these are all local to the scope of this function, rather than just like having to send all of these again to this one, what I might do is I'm going to put my function and have it local inside this function. And so then I can call it from here and I can call it from here as well. So what do we want to do in our check item on remove function? Well, we need to firstly have a reference to the tool. Now, at the moment, um, we're, we've had set this local tool inside key and kitchen, um, but we need to sort of break out of that block. So let's have a little local tool up here, which will be set to nil. And then we'll, instead of making this local, we'll move that local. And so now we can access it down here in this scope. So we want to do that there and here for the kitchen as well. Our coin, we don't actually give them a tool or anything, so that's fine. And then inside check item on remove, 
if we haven't got at all, then we will just return and we don't care, we're not interested. But if that tool, if the parent of that is equal to the player.character, so that would happen if they're currently holding the tool. Um, but the other condition is they might not be holding it, um, but it might be in their backpack. So we check or the tool.parent if that's equal to player.backpack. And if either of those conditions are true, then we need to put that tool and put it back where it was. So let's select both of these. Control X. We'll get rid of this weight. We don't need that either. And so we'll re-enable the prompt and we'll put it back on the shelf. And oh, we need a double equals there. There we go. And I'm just going to disable my local death script so that I can actually reset properly. So let's see if I go into the kitchen and I find an item to grab. Here's one. I've got some herbs. And if I reset my character, there we go. We can see it spawned back on the shelf for someone else to pick up. And we can test as well if the multiple players. So if I start my virtual server up, there we go. We've got two players. And if our first player goes and he picks up some chili and maybe he doesn't even have it selected. And maybe he goes around, he, he grabs all of the ingredients and he's doing really well. But then at the last minute, he gets caught by the skeleton. And oh no, he's dead. Well, it doesn't matter because we can just go and pick up the items again with our second player. No issue. There we go. We've got our chili and we could get our, what's over here? Some beans and some olives. And what's the final item? What was it again? There we go. Salt. So we've got all of the items and we can just play and it doesn't really matter that the other player has died or left. Great. Now, talking of dead players, and let's just re-enable that script before we forget. Um, something we've got to make sure of is when we've been teleporting our players, uh, like when we despawn old rooms, we move the players forward a level. And I think we also do it, um, where is it? When we start off our chase sequence with bacon, we teleport everyone forwards and we're just grabbing the character. But what if a player has died and they've respawned back in this room? Obviously, they can't take part in the game anymore because they're going to have all this UI up on their screen. But we don't want them being like teleported around that place. That's going to be really annoying. So when we kill off the player, let's go and into our character appearance loaded. And we can grab the humanoid of them. Humanoid equals character wait for child humanoid and we're going to connect this into a humanoid dot died event as well and all i'm going to do is i'm going to say player set attribute dead and add a value of true and normally if we look in player service we're not going to have any attributes for ourselves and if i was to reset at some point oh no i've got the ui coming up but i can disable that so now when i disable that ui you can see i'm actually still in the game here um and if i look at my player we can see i now have this attribute of dead equals true doesn't really change anything but we can check for that now in our scripts so let's see where we're teleporting down here let's just say in this loop if player get attribute dead then continue and so we'll just ignore them and we're going to do the same thing here and also so we don't try and teleport anyone uh, for bacon so now if i'm playing with two players let's say one of them goes and he dies early but then the other guy keeps on adventuring through all the levels he's not going to get teleported ahead when those old rooms get discarded anymore so let's see once we get into room uh, number six. And if I look back on the server, we can see it has deleted a bunch of old rooms, but our character is still hanging out here. He doesn't actually know he could move if he want to. Look, we can actually move around with our keyboard and uh, move through the door. Whoops, there he goes. Um, but it doesn't really matter because he's not part of the game anymore. He can't rejoin the action. And well, he's probably not going to keep playing if he can just see this blank screen. So there we go. The only other thing we might want to do with uh, our game here is 
try and tweak some of this light thing at the moment because it is uh, very sort of bright. It's not really giving sort of spooky vibes. So we could add in a skybox for ourselves, a little bit spookier. And then maybe if we toggle some of the lighting, we'll bring the ambience down to, let's try 60. Um, and then the outdoor ambience, let's just set that to zero, which you're not going to see a huge difference. But if you're inside here, it's going to be quite a little bit darker. In fact, we might need to add a little um, light inside of the spawn location like so. And now when we're playing, the once the light loads, and we're inside of those rooms, it feels much different. We've got a much spookier ambience. And now I really feel like I am playing in a horror game with these much richer tones. Really nice. And at this point, we really might as well go and delete the base plate because that's not doing anything for us at this point. We don't need it. So let's just remove it from our game. And we've just got this little strange mysterious box in the middle of nowhere now it's just occurring to me one thing we need to check is in our server script you might remember we changed our door opening or well, specifically for closing actually we did this and we used collection service to get the door to take account of different types of doors we have in our game because at the moment i have two just a door and a kitchen exit i might want to add more later but they're not just called door. And if I look inside bacon or my shadow module, I'm just expecting there to be something called door. So instead, let's go and make sure we're using collection service at the top of our bacon script. We are cool. And then instead of doing this whole thing, let's write out something new. Let's get a list of all the doors in the game. So local doors equals collection service get tagged door. And then I'm going to determine the action to send to the event. So the action is going to equal whether the I is less than the maximum, then we don't want to send anything at all. So basically we can say if it's greater than or equal to the maximum, and really it's only ever going to be equal to, so if it is equal to, then we will use lock. Otherwise, it will just be a nil value. And then let's loop through all of the doors. So for IV indoors do, and we'll find the door. So now it's V, whose parent is equal to the room we're inside of. And if that's the case, then we can access the event so v dot open event fire bacon and along with the action which is either going to be lock or nil so now we can go ahead and remove this whole thing and then let's just copy this go into our shadow module and here we're firing the open event let's paste in that we don't need the action anymore and we'll change bacon to shadow get rid of that action value. And then we can get rid of this line here and make sure that we are using collection service up at the top of your script. So one other thing to bear in mind with our shadow monster and also bacon is when they're moving through those doors, they call this door.open function and that keeps firing player enter, um, which is great, but that could actually have knock on effects for our teleportation, if remember, where we're trying to keep everyone together in the same rooms. But obviously, if like Shadow moves a bunch of rooms ahead of the player, we don't want to teleport everyone. So in our door to open uh, function, we're just going to have another parameter. We'll call this is bot. OK, and then we'll send this into the player enter event, which we can access on the server. Make sure we have the like the bot name. I know it's is bot, but it's also the name of the bot. And then when we're doing the despawning old rooms, let's not actually do any of that uh, if we have a bot name. So let's say if not bot name, then we will do all the discarding of rooms and the shutting of doors and the teleporting of people. Uh, otherwise, we just don't want to bother with that because that's going to cause us a bunch of problems. And then another tiny little sort of quality of life change I want to make. 
Uh, inside of my room.blackout function, I'm assuming that everything has a lamp. Uh, obviously, it might not do. So let's just check uh, if the room model, uh, if it doesn't contain any lamps, then return and, and exit out of it. Otherwise, carry on as you were. So if we just play through this now, let's do it a little test. Moving through room one into two, and I've set it up so shadow will come along at room number six, a uh, long corridor, and the moment we get into this room, oh, here he comes, quick, 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 quick. <laughs> we were actually too slow. Maybe that's something to tweak later, but if we head on to the server, um, we can find the point that uh, Shadow came through. Look, he came through all these dark rooms here, and we can see, that's where I got killed, just here, by this very closet, that we haven't... Um, like try to teleport anyone forward or like despawn any of the rooms which would be getting in the way. So there's our character and he has the game still to play. We have the game to finish up. I think it'd be nice if we had maybe a spectate system to keep him busy while he's in here. But that's all for today's episode. So thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.